Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the 36th Caller Lab Convention. Today is April 6th and this is Digital Music Editing. I am Chris Jensen and your panelist today is Clark Baker. Clark is has been doing musical editing for a while, doing a lot of different kinds of, of music editing. He actually uses vinyl, I believe, to call with. But he's done a lot of editing for some other purposes. Uh, let me just say a little bit about why we're talking about this. Um, we talked in the last session about using digital music and getting digital music and using a laptop and different things that dances. But one of the real strong points of using digital music is the things that you can do with your music once you get it digitized and on your computer. So we talked about using your using the digital music and instead of looping, if you wanted to use an MP3 player, you could make long patter records. So you can edit your music by copying and pasting parts of the waveform and lengthening your music by doing that. You can change the tempo on your music. We talked about last session of adding sound effects to your music. Um, at one of the uh, music sessions this morning, we had some music where the um, the caller had added his own harmony to the music. So you can do that by using digital music and digital music editing systems. You can remove noise. So if you have a scratchy recording, you can do that. If you're using alternative music, you can remove um, remove parts of the music that don't work with the pattern that you want to call. So there are all kinds of things that you can do once you get into dig editing digital music, and Clark is going to show you some of the things that he does and also give you a basis to go further in your own musical editing endeavors. So, Clark. Thank you. Um, so this is a talk I gave last year. Um, my plan is to be pretty similar to what I did last year. Were any of you at last year's talk? One. Great. Hopefully... I won't bore you with this or something. Um, I am flexible. We can head off in different directions. Um, Chris is going to try to keep me on track, both time-wise and if I get too technical or there's something that she wants to amplify on or anything like that, she's going to interrupt and, and, and warn me because I might just get too focused on something. Uh, I have a talk. Uh, there's handouts. They're on the web. They have links. So it's better to use the one that's on the web. This is just a printout of the web page. The address of it is on the bottom of the handout. But in general, if you Google Clark Baker Square Dance, um, the site that doesn't have my calendar but has all my talks, every talk I've given at Color Lab, including the Beginner Dance Party Leader Seminars, the Digital Music Editing, the Beat Math talk that comes later in the convention, the talks I gave last year and the year before, those are all online with links, and I try to keep those up to date. And that includes the alternative music or non-standard pattern music talk from like three, four, five years ago. So all that stuff's there. There's a treasure trove of other talks, either by me or by other people that I've collected, similar to what you were collecting with the stuff on how to do um, how to do the the music preparation and, and so forth. Um, okay, so I see the first problem is the wireless mic. Like, okay, this is going to be weird. Um, Everything Chris said, measuring beats per minute, changing beats per minute, and all that, beats per minute, and all that are possible digitally. Let's just start out with one of those. I'm going to bring up a piece of music. Um, I'm a Mac user, so the program I use, unfortunately, is only available on the Mac. The features that I'm using, any competent uh, music editing program like Audacity, the one that's, that's available for free, uh, would have. Uh, the thing I've heard is that the free programs often are a little harder to use, maybe not documented quite as well. Um, that would be the downside of using it. But I'd have nothing wrong with using Audacity. It runs on both a Mac and a PC. Uh, it's just I'm not a familiar user of it, so I'm going to use the program I know best. It's one I've been using for, I don't know, seven or eight years called Sound Studio. It costs about 100 bucks. Uh, hold on. I like it because it... 
I like it because it's simple. Some of the real expensive top-of-the-line programs, the $500 programs, are so complicated to use. It's kind of you need to be a professional in the business. So let me just read in. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, I think we're going to be editing Run, Run Away uh, by Slade, which a uh, caller uses for patter. And I don't know what its beats per minute are. So hold on. So I dragged the the sound source file uh, into the application, and it's opening it up. And here we have a waveform window. Um, and that looks pretty dense. Uh, let's see if you can see my – there's my mouse. Um, I want to point you to – there's – in this particular program, first off, this is a stereo file. So we have a waveform at the top and a waveform at the bottom, and they look pretty much identical. Uh, there's time across the top here. I'm at zero seconds there. And here we're up to four minutes and almost five minutes at the end. So this is a five-minute piece of music. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I'm clicking on the Zoom In button here, and we'll zoom in. And now we're at a point where we're seeing about 18 seconds of music on the screen. And just to see it work, I'm going to hit play, and we'll hear the song's intro in the beginning. I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to turn it up on my computer, too, because that's not loud enough for me. Okay. So that's good. Now, how do we measure beats per minute? Well, if there were, there may be programs in the market. I'm not familiar with any that I've seen that really work. You could just imagine giving it the digital music, having it listen like we're going to, and tell you what the beats per minute are. And I don't know a program that does that or that does that reliably. Does anyone in the room use a program like that? No one raised their hand. Okay. So I have an application that Rich Real wrote. It's just a web page. You can go to it on his website. He's a caller, and he happens to be at the convention here. Um, and I have a copy of it stored on my computer. So let me just double-click on that. Hold on. The question is, do they have meters that measure beats per, beats per minute, like musical, you know, for helping? They have, certainly have instruments that help you tune your piano, your violin, or whatever, and tell you if you're sharp or flat. Is there a similar thing for beats per minute? I don't know. I imagine there is. It would be the same thing as what would run on a computer but be packaged in a small set of equipment. But I don't know one that works well. Um, and and so and this isn't too 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 burdensome for me. What I do here is you tap it as you're hearing the song playing, and um, you'll see it's going to display the beats per minute. Um, and you're going to watch that number jump all over the place because all it's doing is it's going to watch the time when you hit the first keystroke, and it's going to measure the time to the next keystroke, and then the time from the very first keystroke to however many you're at now. It's going to count how many there are and do the do the math for you. So let me just start the music playing, and I'll start tapping, and you're going to see the number kind of jump around and then settle down. Okay, so I'm tapping not on the keyboard just to make sure I can be with the beat of music. I feel like I'm doing pretty good. Hit, hit, oh, uh, yes. That would be me talking to the wrong application. Here we go. Tap, 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 tap. 126. We're at 128.9. It's dropping a little bit. This is great because 128 is a good, good rate for modern Western square dancing. So I'm going to stop there. And let me stop the music. Ah. Oh, 
maybe yours works. I'll use yours rather than mine. So that's okay. Now, you've just seen the feature of the – a Mac has a thing called the MagSafe plug, which is a magnetic plug so that if someone trips over your cord, they won't pull your laptop off the table. We're going to do that. Okay. So we think this was 129 beats per minute. Let's pretend we want it. In New England, we dance a bit slower. We dance at the 126 rate, I would say. So let's see about 126 beats per minute. Let's see what that, if we want to change the tempo to that. Okay. There I am on the other thing. Yay. Okay. That's a good idea. Um, so we want to change the tempo. And because changing the tempo can take some time, I'm going to select from the beginning of this piece of music maybe the first 30 seconds. I'm going to do the command to copy that. I'm going to create a new window, and I'm going to paste it. So now we have a window that only has 30 seconds of music. And also, I'm not playing with my original just in case I'm messing around. I'm going to go up to the filter menu, and here's all the kinds of things you'd see in a typical waveform editing program. I'm going to go down to pitch and tempo, and I get another menu, and I can change the pitch up or down by cents, C-E-N-T-S. We don't want to change the pitch, so we'll leave it at 100 cents and hope that's the right thing. Here we have a tempo thing. I can change it with a slider, or I can change it by actually typing in a number here. But the problem is, this particular program, I can't type in and say, I'm at 129 beats a minute. I want to go to 126. Instead, it wants to know what percentage that is. Well, it's going to be a number less than 100. We're, we're, we're actually bigger than 100, right? So I'm going to bring up my calculator. And if I want to slow it down, no, we want we want a smaller number, right? So I want a smaller number. So I'm going to put the I'm going to make a number that a ratio is going to get smaller. So I'm going to go 126 divided by 129 equals 0.97. It says we want to be playing this at 97.6 percent of what we were. That seems a little burdensome, but if you do it 100 times, you get used to it. So 97.6. So in that window there, the one that's highlighted, 97.67. And I'm going to say OK, and it's going to go change the tempo and not change the pitch. And we'll play again. And I'll even bring up this, and let's measure the new one. I did it right, or maybe I just stopped when the number looked like what I wanted. What's the assumption we've made about this piece of music? We've assumed that the band played at a constant tempo. <laughs> and not all bands, not all music's like that. So there's times when I'll measure the beginning of the piece of music and the end of the piece of music to make sure they didn't speed up or slow down. If they were playing by a metronome, no problem. So there we did, we, we changed the, the tempo. Uh, anyone have any questions or anything more you want me to do with that? We have a question there, and you're going to get a microphone in just a second. Okay, you changed the 30 seconds. What's your name, sir? Jay Krebs, Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you. You've changed the tempo on the 30 second one now, and you know it's now 97.67. So you're going to get rid of this file and change the original? If I wanted to do this for real, I would go change the tempo on the on the whole thing. And I probably would have just done it with the real one. I didn't want to have it. Sometimes it might take a minute to do it. I didn't want to wait that time and, and stuff. But, yeah, if this was something I wanted to do and save it out and have it for my MP3 player or use it in an application where I need the tempo permanently changed, I would do it. And I would also, on the file name, you'll see some of the file names on my computer actually have a number at the end of each thing saying that this is blue played at 126 or blue at 128. Um, because on the Mac, if I just play music right now, I do not have a way to play it and change the tempo in real time. Um, I do own Chris. I mean, I, I don't use the program that Chris uses, and you can do that on yours, correct? Yeah, I can do that. I also just wanted to mention that Audacity has an effect called Change Tempo, and you can put in, you can say, I want to change the beats per minute from 
x to y, and it'll do the calculation that's, that Clark did. So. J. Krebs, Kansas City again. I've heard Audacity mentioned both in the earlier session and this session, and I suppose it's a good program. However, I have Vista on my home laptop, and Audacity does not work well with Vista. So that's something you need to understand if you've got one of the newer laptops with Microsoft's latest and greatest Vista program. Okay, let me say to that that um, I would keep an eye on it because Audacity is open source. It's being developed all the time. It's being worked on. If people want it to run on Vista, it will ultimately run on Vista. So just check for updates. It's being updated pretty frequently. Okay. Um, I want to go in. Roy has a question. Roy Gata, New Jersey. No, no, a different, different comment. Uh, Roy Gata from New Jersey. Uh, since not all of us are MIT graduates, um, and we do do the math wrong, and we've just changed the tempo in our entire file. I'm not familiar with that program, but I would imagine you can go up into the edit and undo the tempo change. Cor correct. Um, this particular program didn't used to have infinite undo, but it now does. You can see right now in this menu, there's undo, pitch, and tempo. And I do that, and now we're back where we were. And I can redo pitch and tempo, and now we're back the other way. And just while I'm mentioning it, um, this piece of music down at the bottom here where I have my cursor says it's 41 seconds and some a little bit of fraction and if I go up and undo it it's now 40.6 seconds so since we slowed it down it gets longer it gets shorter you can see the waveform jumping around okay I want to go into what a waveform looks like just a little bit um, I'm going to make a new window uh, and I'm going to insert uh, a tone um, and it, I don't frankly don't use this menu hardly ever. I see we have a 440 hertz, that's cycles per second tone, um, and uh, it's going to be a sine wave. We'll talk about that in a second if you want. It's going to put in five seconds of it, and I'm worried that it says zero dB, but I'll leave that for a moment, and I'm going to just do that, and there we have it, and I want to zoom in on that for a sec. And I'm going in more and more and more and more and more and more, and finally... If you remember any stuff from school where you were talking about sine waves, this is a sine wave. It's going up and down. It's a periodic sine wave. It has some period of, we could measure it. And I'm looking on the screen. I'm as zoomed in as I can get. This number at the 1 says it's 1x. So that's as zoomed in as I can get. And I'm looking at, let me go all the way to the very beginning of this, I'm from time zero up to 0.02 of a second. That's not very long. So if I zoom out, and I'm afraid this is going to be loud, so I'm going to move my volume down so we don't blast it. Let's hear what it sounds like. So that's a 440 hertz, 440 cycles per second sound. That means the loudspeaker, the cone in that is going back and forth 440 times a second. The air in this room is being vibrated 440 times a second. Your eardrums being vibrated 440 times a second. And your semicircular canals, somewhere along there that has the right resonant frequency to 440 cycles per second is a little piece of hair that's vibrating, and the nerve connected to that goes into your brain and says that sounds like uh, what we're hearing. Okay? And if I crank this up to 20,000, which is a pretty high-pitched sound, and played it, some of us in the room wouldn't hear a thing, and a few of us might go, oh, I hear that, um, because that's where our adult hearing starts to drop off. So that's what the waveforms look like really close up. Now let's go back and see what music looks like. Is this new to anybody? Is this interesting to people? Is this okay? So I'm going to zoom in, and there's the intro. We don't really care about the intro. Let's get to some beats. Now, I'm guessing this big, <coughs> this big guy here 
<clears throat> is, um, excuse me, is going to be beat one. And I'm betting over here is another beat. And just to be kind of nerdy about it, if I select that as a region, that's one beat to another beat, down at the bottom, the length of that selected period is 0.485 seconds. That's half a second. Now, if we're dancing along at 128 beats a minute, we're taking two steps for every beat. I'm sorry, we're taking um, two steps every second, approximately. So that means every step, we're taking a step about every half second. So there's another way to confirm that I probably got it right. I could play it. I'm going to crank the volume up a bit because we haven't heard it yet. Was that one beat? I hear some extra stuff. But we don't know, you know, they aren't just going beat, beat, beat. They're going, you know, and doing kind of being fancy. So I'll just play it, and you can kind of visually see how the, the noise you see on the screen, the waveforms, relate to what you're hearing in your ear. Okay. So I think that was a beat, but the unit of a beat, when we just hear it in isolation, doesn't really sound very good. Um, I'm betting if I select this region approximately, we're capturing two beats. And if I were to loop that, I'm going to go up to audio and turn on loop while playing. It actually sounds pretty good. You almost like would call that a seamless loop. So the next thing I do with my music is I want to identify all the beats if I'm going to do some editing with it. Because if I edit on the beat boundaries, then I'll have seamless edits. And you'll be amazed that even though I can't create new music, I don't have the instruments and the mix and the raw tapes, I can do a lot with this music just cutting and pasting and manipulating it. And it's not as scary as it sounds, and you don't hurt anything, and all you can do is listen and you know, see if it sounded like what you're looking for. So let me show you how I put down uh, the beat markers. I'm going to back it up. I zoomed out one. Um, so they're doing their intro. Now, what I have here is an ability to drop a marker. And I'll show you a marker. Um, if I hit Command-M, there's a marker. And it says Marker 1. It's in red. And uh, the nice thing about markers is you can click on them and go to them, and you can measure the distance between them. I'm going to slide that marker over to, I'm dragging it over to this first big beat. I think that's actually the first beat after the intro. I'm going to play. I'm going to drop some more markers. I typically drop a marker every 16 beats because a lot of our music, we speak of our music as being in 8-beat phrases, um, but the main reason I'm doing the editing, I like the 16-beat phrases. So we'll see what we've got. I'm going to start play. I'm going to start counting, and I didn't do it. One, two. This is hard to do if I have an audience. Well, I'm not able to do this here. I'm going to do start in the second 16. I'll ignore the first marker. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1, 2, 3, too bad we were doing that to our little unnamed sample rather than the real piece of music, huh? Okay. Uh, that's too bad, but we'll make use of what we got here. So you got a sense of how I was dropping those markers. And, in fact, I think I was on the 16-beat phrase because the next piece of music, the next instrument came in and so forth. Um, I think I was getting faked out. Let's zoom in on one of these. I'm going to click on that and zoom in. Um, you'll notice the big guys we were looking for for the beats, they weren't the main beats. They were the half beats. 
you know, it was like boom, chuck or something. And, and so I got tricked. So there I think I'm really on the main beat there. Now it spreads out over a little bit of time. I typically try to pick the piece like I would normally adjust that just slightly right there. I'll zoom in even more and show you. So there I am. There's a lot of, a lot of violent vibrations there. Um, on the bottom, the one, the top one is the left channel. The bottom one's the right channel. Um, I normally edit the music in stereo because that's how it's recorded and we're used to listening. It's not how we play it on our final turntables and um, or out our sound system with the uh, Hiltons and the, the mono speakers. You can combine this if you want. It will average the top and bottom waveforms together. There's a command for that. Um, so I think I've aligned marker two about as perfectly as I can. And I'm going to go over to marker three, which is off to my right. There it is, and I'm going to zoom in on it, and I do this a lot. I, you have to zoom out, move around, and zoom in, otherwise you get lost. And that one was placed pretty good. And then let's see if this works well. I'm going to select the, uh, the space between the two, and I'm going to put it back on looping, and I'm going to just play it. And we want to hear if it's seamless as it loops around. tapping your hand to the beat or moving your body something physical that's the way I tell if I'm tapping my hand pretty pretty good or I'm moving my body to it if I don't have the beat thing exactly right or if I orally hear a glitch then I'll know I didn't get it right well why might you want to do that well we're talking about music editing maybe for some reason we don't want that if I hit delete it's gone you notice it's marker one marker three now, let's hear if marker one transitions into marker three with no problems. I'm going to play the second half of marker one and just play on through. Even if you knew that song, my bet is you would not recognize that I deleted 16 beats of music unless you were listening to the overall total structure of the song as opposed to the individual little snippet that I played. I'm going to play that again, and we're going to listen. Um, I'm going to start it at marker one, so it's going to be 16. Uh, we didn't get marker one in the right place. We actually think marker one belongs, like, right there. So we're going to listen for count to 16, and then it hits marker three, and the transition right after beat 16 Let's hear what we hear. I'm gonna. I'll even play the intro. So here we go. One, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So what I've just shown you is how to do a seamless edit. You line it up on the beat markers. I use that little trick of looping and listening if it sounds good, and I just deleted it out, and it's gone. And that's what I do a lot for the type of editing I'm doing. Now, I should tell you a little bit about why I edit music. Um, one reason we mentioned to edit music is to lengthen patter records, especially if you're using them on an iPod, which doesn't let you set track marks and do looping. Or if I were burning it on a um, CD, and if my CD player didn't have looping, or I didn't want to have, it doesn't remember the loop marks. So when I burn music onto CDs and play off a CD player, I typically make at least 10 minutes. I set my, my patter tips when I do, don't have a singing call to 10 minute tips. And I, I try to end at 10, I may end at 11. So my music should be in the 10, 11, 12 minute range and then I won't have a problem. So um, that's one reason is to lengthen music. And I will show you a piece of music I lengthen that way. Give me a moment. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, I think this one here. Um, this is blue, and uh, I, I, this is not, uh, yeah, okay, so this is good to look at. So what we're seeing is the waveform for blue. Let me turn down the volume and play it just so you recognize the song. This is on uh, by a group called Eiffel 65, um, and a lot of people use this for um, pattern music. Now, what I see is you see I've dropped a lot of beat lines, beat marks, 
um, at least for the first half. There's a, this is where, just looking at the waveforms and the zoomed out growth structure, right in here, I can see the music change. Let's hear how that changed. I'm going to start playing, and then 16 beats in, we'll hear how the music changes. <laughs> So the guy stops singing, it goes into some instrumental, it doesn't have the beat going on. Maybe you don't want to be dancing through this part. If the dancers are moving along and you've got them going with your voice, you could keep doing it. It picks up. I can see over here on the right, it probably does that again. And while I can't tell you whether I did it or not, I may have actually replicated the first half of the song into the second half, and that's how I got a seven-and-a-half-minute version of Blue at 126 beats a minute. And that's not quite long enough for what I want to use for patter, so I'd probably replicate it a third time, save it out, and then I would be done. Um, so that's one reason to edit music. Another reason is um, I actually like to contradance, and contradancing is done more strongly on the phrase of the music than modern Western dancing. So... Um, I need music that's done in groups of 16. And typically, just like a singing call, every 64 beats in a contra dance, you've moved on and you're now dancing with a new group of four. You kept your partner, but you have um, new neighbors. And I like dancing sometimes to the pop music. Um, so I want to edit pop music that I can use for contra dancing. And one thing I need to do is we usually start, when you have a live band, with so-called four potatoes, four whole notes. You know, bump, 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 bump and then you're going, is the caller, you would hear the bump, bump, and you'd say balance and swing, or, you know, bump, bump, grand square, if that's what you were doing as a caller. You probably might not have noticed it, but this one has four potatoes. So a contra dance caller could start with this piece of music. They'd hear the tempo, they'd hear the two beats, they'd give the next command, um, and I had to add those four potatoes on. I'll zoom in. There they are. You can watch them play it again. So I really added three potatoes, and then the guy comes in, but it's timed so it's exactly four potatoes and has the right tempo. So that's one reason, as I edit the potatoes on the front. We don't like listening to the same tune for our eight and a half minutes of dancing. We usually medley three tunes together. So another reason I'm doing editing is to take the piece of music and then find the and then merge it with another piece of music and a third piece of music, much like some of the DJs slide from one song seamlessly into another. And I can show you that if we, if we want to do that. Um, a third reason is maybe the music you've got is good, but it has something that is not really, in your opinion, danceable. For example, that blue thing where we had the, um, this little section in here. Oops, wrong, Clark. Back it up. Uh, back it out even more. This big one here. Maybe we just want to delete that. And using that other beat editing technique, we got to move the. Okay, he's like a, he's this marker is aligned just in the little valley before that beat. Let's assume that that's pretty good. Zoom out. Go over two. Look at where the, this guy starts. Zoom in. He's starting right in the power part of that. I'm going to move that marker back to my left just a little bit. Hopefully I got it. Good. Zoom out. Select both of those. Put it on looping. And I'm going to, I actually have a way, I, we could listen to the whole thing, but I really want to hear, does the end of this loop into the beginning well? If that's true, then deleting it is also likely to feel good. And if I remember how, uh, if I shift click here, does he start playing? Nope. If I control click there, does he start playing? Um. Okay. I'm going to go for it. That sounded good to me. I know it was pretty quick for you. And if I do there and hit play. I didn't like that as much. I don't know if that, let me play it again for you. That sounded a little abrupt, and I don't think I would, the, I might be on the beat. If you look at all the long lines, it seems like they're kind of evenly spaced, but, but thematically it sounded kind of jarring. I can't.
came in on the word blue. He's saying, I'm blue, and he's leading the, the beat right where he's about to say it. Just like you say, side space, grand square, and then you start moving. He's saying, I'm blue, but he smeared that across the beat. So all, when I did this editing, all we picked up for him was part of the blue. So there is an edit where I'm on the beat, but I cut his words off. So that one wouldn't be good. I'd have to do something different if I really want to do it. So I'm just going to undo it. But I, might, I if I was a little more work, um, and I don't know, do you want to make me do that work and see me make that a seamless edit, or should I move on to something else? You, well, it's, uh, proof's in doing it. What I, my trick when I can't edit like this is I'm going to move both sides of that region back to the left the consistent amount and see how that works. So let's just try moving the left edge and the right edge back approximately a beat. And I think I have to zoom in on each. Whenever I'm doing this work, you have to be up close. So I'm going to move, I'm going to drop a new marker here. I'm going to put it right on that, right in the middle of that fat beat, Command M. Okay, and then I'm going to zoom out. And on this side, I'm going to zoom in. I'm on the right edge. And this is the best we've got for the fat beat. And I'm going to even go back a little bit, Command M. I'm going to zoom out. And I'm going to select the same length. Okay, that's good. I have to extend my selection to the left to get that extra little piece. And there, I didn't get it. And now I have to add it over here. Oh, look at that. It isn't going to let me do both. So I'm going to try again. I'm used to running this program with a mouse, but I, I brought a mouse, but plugs in on the wrong side, and you don't want to hear my problems. Here we go. Uh, let's not lose where we are and see if the magic works. I think it was better, but the background noise changed substantially. There's lots of music playing, and then he's into a very quiet thing. So I might find that acceptable, especially if I'm calling patter over it. I'll play it once more for you. But I think I'm on the beat, and I think I'm on the phrasing. Getting off the fr it felt syncopated. Just the way, oh, um, do you think I'm off the beat, or do you think I missed the beat by a little bit? He's saying it's syncopated. Okay, well, let's try it once more and just kind of tap tap your hand pretty strongly and see what you think. I think you might be right. I think I might have missed it just a teensy bit. And maybe that other fat beat I picked, he also syncopated it, and I got tricked by his syncopation. That, but that's kind of what I do. And there's a bunch of tricks to try. Let me check where I'm in. In my talk, I have marketing musical phrases. We talked about that. I talked about cutting and pasting. Um, I'm going to stop the music editing in this part and go into equalization. You talked about equalization in your talk a little bit. Um, Let's pretend, what's wrong with this piece of music? Maybe we think it's got too much bass beat going there. We want to take out a little bit of bass, uh, especially in this section. Um, so I'm going to go up. I selected the section. I'm going to go up to the filter. We have five different ways in this program we could play with the equalization. Let's talk about the 10-band equalizer. This is something you might see on a piece of stereo equipment. You have 10 sliders. Right now, all the sliders are set at 0 dB, 0 decibels. We can increase that amount of a certain band of frequencies, or we could decrease it. It looks like the way this is set up, we're mostly going to be decreasing it. And then across the top, we have a range of frequencies. The first slider controls the 40 hertz frequency. Um, that's pretty slow. That's a very low note, 40 cycles per second. And then there's an 80 slider hertz, 160, 320. Notice they keep doubling, 640, and so forth. And actually, um, 
Okay, so let's. We want to get rid of the base. I'm going to take 24 decibels out of the base at 40, and 12 decibels out at 80, and 6 decibels out at 160, and just a little bit there. So I'm kind of making a, a roll off on the base. I'm getting rid of some base. I'm going to say okay, and we're going to hear the the piece of music right before it, which is pretty. It was just repeating itself. So this is going to be the old stuff playing into the new stuff. That's the old stuff. Frankly, I didn't hear much bass go away. It sounded just about as loud and just about the same to me. Is that what people heard? I see the waveforms look different, but it sounded just about the same to me. Let me play it again. Here's the old... So here's what I did. I closed my eyes so I wasn't watching the waveform. I focused my brain on hear the bass drum, hear the beat going at the bass level, and then I could I could kind of tell when it hit into the other music. I think we really did remove bass. One more time. I hear bass. I think I don't hear it. It's subtle, but it's there. Um, let's undo that. And um, maybe we had some screechy high end. We didn't, but we'll get rid of that. I'll do, I'm going to do the same thing with the 10-band equalizer. This is the one I normally use because it gives you enough control but not too much control. So we are going to take out a lot of the 20 kilohertz, which we don't think we really hear, and then some 10 kilohertz, which I think is pretty important, and a little bit of the 5, and let's see what that does for us. Okay. And again, you can just play with this stuff. So we're going to do the old and the new. Well, we sure know where a lot of the stuff in that song is. Let's undo that. That was pretty extreme. Um, and perhaps go back to our filter. And I'm actually going to do a different experiment for you. Let me zoom out. Sometimes this works on this program, and sometimes it's a little buggy. It actually has a feature where I can do the changes in real time like you would if you're just playing the record on a stereo. So I'm going to hit uh, Filter, Graphic Equalizer, and, oops, sorry, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Filter, 10-band equalizer, and I'm going to reset the sliders. I'm going to hit Preview. Here I'm playing with 10, kil 10 kilohertz. Down, down, down. All gone. Back to normal. Here's the 5 kilohertz. Here's the 2 kilohertz. So when you do it to the extreme, it makes you sound like you're talking underwater or you're muddy. And in fact, someone with a hearing problem, think about that. Your dancers who don't hear you so well, their ears are probably taking your sound in, which may be perfect, and they're applying their own built-in, not that they want it, graphic equalizer to what they're hearing, and they're moving a bunch of these frequencies down. They've lost their high-end hearing. They may have a problem in one ear with something else. And then they have a hearing age, which is coming in and amplifying it all, trying to bring them back up, but that's an approximate thing. You could understand why they have some problems hearing what's going on. Greg has a question or a comment. Greg Anderson, Colorado. This is perhaps the wrong place to make the point known where it really would matter, but since we're talking about the equalizer, when I'm, I'm thinking about record producers who put out, re-released a song that was out, a decade ago, I've bought a couple of them on CD in the past year because my old ones got scratchy and I'm not yet equipped to start doing editing to get rid of scratchiness sounds. And I've been extremely disappointed in some cases to find out that they have put so much bass in the CD that they've totally lost the high notes as far as the enjoyment of the music is concerned. Do I assume correctly that in the studio they're doing something with the equalizer to do that? And have you heard any conversations about to know why they're doing it? Are they doing it because of the lack of 
base response in speakers? Or have you heard any conversations about that that might trigger why they're doing it? I haven't. Um, they could be doing something at this level of detail. Um, or there are special boxes you can buy that have sound processing algorithms in them, sometimes proprietary, that if I just had a singer singing or doing a performance um, and taped it and mixed it and it sounded okay, and then you put it through the magic box, it just makes it sound better. People like it better. Um, it might brighten it up. I don't quite know exactly what it's doing. As I say, those are secret. Um, maybe they're doing something there. If you take a record, if they don't have the real old masters and they had to get it off a record, when you take that sample at the beginning, you're taking a certain bunch of frequencies. It's going to figure out which frequencies you've got going and at what level, and then it subtracts that out throughout the entire piece. That can take out some some of the brightness or liveliness or 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 whatever right adjective you need to use to describe the music. That can take that out and make it sound deader. Sometimes speeding it up and slowing it down, even if it doesn't introduce artifacts, uh, weird sounds and clicks and stuff. And this program, older programs I've used to change tempo have, had, have added artifacts or removed the energy from the music. This one seems pretty good. But even if you don't get artifacts, you can still have some subtler things, like it just doesn't seem as good, it's muddier, it's bassier, or something. And you can't always get it back just by putting the sliders the other way. Right. We have another question, Chris. Arnold Gladson, Cedar Park, Texas. Um, when you're editing this stuff, do you do you listen for these kind of changes through the speakers you're going to play it in? Or if you get it from your PC speaker, is that sufficient enough knowing that when it gets transported over through the amp, it's going to come out the same? Because I would think you get a whole range of differences between all of this. How do you feel about that or how to get the most reproduction you want? The, the lesson I've learned is um, I used to work, I mean, our studio um, is really just a room in a house with a Mac sitting there. And I and I instead of using the Mac's built-in speakers, I used to use um, I don't remember whose it is, but it's a you know plug-in. It has a couple speakers on the desk and actually has a bass box on the floor, um, and that makes my sound sound pretty good. And I used to edit and use that, but then we take it to the dance hall and play it out either a Yak or what you see contra dance bands have for their speakers, and we get surprised stuff that we didn't hear in the studio because we were using smaller not as good speakers we'd suddenly hear when you amplify it up in a bigger room so because of that we now have a small pv system that we put the two speakers up on the wall we have the the thing there the max feeding into that and we go through one of those usb external sound cards and when we're doing an edit and want to really hear we crank it up quite a bit to see what we're hearing so that isn't the same sound system we're using in the real hall, but it is. it was important for us to hear a louder sound out of a bigger set of better quality speakers than just a computer speaker. Perhaps if I used a headphone um, or head, you know, headphones like what we used to have in our college days where everyone was into the big you know, $100, $500 headphones, maybe that would be a better way to do editing. I honestly don't know. But I have learned the lesson that it does matter. It does matter. Yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, editing with the speakers you're, you want to play it on. Realize that the Yak Stacks, um, and I have an article on my website from the manufacturer of Yak Stack, which shows how to properly use Yak Stacks and what the sound response of them is, et cetera, et cetera. Realize that those are designed for our square dance activity, and that means they're designed to reproduce our vocal range really well and send that a long distance. And the sound quality in terms of really bassy notes and really high-pitched notes and all that, they're not necessarily so good at. Um, I'm also interested, although I'm not an owner, but I'm, I keep like looking at it like, boy, I sure want to buy that. The Bose system. Um, do, do you have one, Greg? Greg has one and can speak to it. There's a great white paper on their website, and they've since come out with the second and third generations and some extra bells and whistles. If someday Hilton stopped making our Hiltons, as we've moved to digital music, I believe that we could survive with a Bose sound system just fine because the Bose sound system has four inputs, two for 
microphones or fancy inputs and two for simpler inputs like, for example, a laptop. And it's a column speaker in a stick similar to the Yak Stack. It has smaller speakers spaced more evenly. It can throw a sound just like our Yak Stacks can a long distance, the length of a gymnasium or whatever, or even if you're working outdoors, a whole parking lot's length. And it comes with a built-in amplifier. So it's an amplifier and four channels, just like we need. It has high wattage, you know, the 500 watts that we're used to. I think it can certainly do that. And it comes with bass boxes. It has better fidelity for because it's meant for real musicians people doing acoustic sets, people sitting in small theaters with 200 people listening. Um, we can do very well by that system. It is kind of heavy and a little more cumbersome than an MA-150. And the trick I just learned that I, I think is, will save us is callers are used to using an MA-150. You could have an MA-150 as where you plug in all your mics and all your computers and your remote control for volume and put the output of the MA-150 and just use the Bose system as the amplifier. And that's a great way that compromises among both both sides of our world. We have, And that's what Greg does. We have a comment. A question for Greg, uh, since we got sidetracked on the Bose system. How is it going to handle the constant moving, going in the trunk, setting up, taking down? I've not had a problem, but keep in mind that I only do about 60 dances a year, so I'm not giving it the workout that a full-time caller would, would give it. But I, I always take care of my equipment, too, uh, but it seems to be very sturdy. They, I've got the first generation, the generation they've got now. The generation I have is shaped kind of like a manhole cover with one flat side to it, and the new generation is more shaped like the letter H, so they've taken out a bunch of weight and still have the electronics in the base unit. But with the 22 speakers in the column, it's a 7-foot tall column with 22 speakers in it, and then the base, the subwoofer, uh, it's a glorious piece of music. But it seems I've not had any problems yet. Luckily, I have a Bose repairman in town in Colorado Springs if I ever need repairs, but it's been very sturdy. Uh, it's my understanding with that system, I don't use it, but I've talked with people about it, that it was the designer of the system designed it for use in bars. So, and to take the abuse from bars and the actual engineer who designed it for Bose did square dance calling. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, after equalization in the talk, uh, we talked about, or we're going to talk about creating medleys. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, and um, I'm a little ill prepared here, so give me one second. Um, this laptop's actually shared by its owner and me. I just borrow it, and I'm trying to find uh, a piece of music to demonstrate to you. Uh, why are you doing this to me? Yeah, I think it's because I updated it. And uh, oh, good. Okay, good, good, good. So I have some examples. Um, and you can hear me do this if you come to the Zesty Contra Dance um, on um, tomorrow night, I think. So what I want to do is show you how we medley stuff away. And we were just medley stuff. So we were just talking about the run, run away one. So here's one um, we call Cotton Eyed Runaway. I'm going to drag it out of iTunes so I have a file I can play with. And I'm going to drag that into Sound Studio so I can actually play it. And we can see the waveforms. And um, I'll play the beginning of it. This is going to be loud. Turn it down, Clark. If it hadn't been for Cotton Eye Joe, I'd been married a long time ago. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? If it hadn't been for Cotton Eye Joe, I'd been married a long time ago. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? should be familiar with that piece of music. 
Uh, it's used for a line dance. The kids all like it at uh, beginner party dances. Um, did it sound different? And the difference is? Greg saying not as sharp. Um, the tempo is 119 beats a minute, which is a tempo that I would use for contra dancing, but is in fact really slow compared to the original piece of music. I don't remember the original beats per minute of Cotton Eye Joe, but this is off the Rednecks CD, or you can get it on iTunes from Rednecks. This is the standard version when people want it. But I bet it's at least 128, if not even up, if not 140. So this is an example of slowing it down drastically, and it still sounds okay. It might sound draggy. You notice that it wasn't quite what you're used to. That's a problem when you tempo change popular songs where everyone has in their, their brain, this is what it feels like. Now, we want to change it in. We want to medley into this tune. That's the one we were listening to earlier, Slade's Run, Run Away. And I'll zoom in on the transition, and you can see if you like it. And then Slate slowly builds and adds instruments. So what did I do there? We had this. That was pretty loud, Cotton Eye Joe. That's Cotton Eye Joe rolling right along. Then we went into, I looped back to a different piece of Cotton Eye Joe, perhaps near the beginning. I don't remember where I took it from. Without all the... So I got a piece that was quieter because if you transition on really loud music into some other really loud music, it's jarring. And if you can get to a more instrumental without a lot of singing thing, we find we can do the transition better. Um, and if I take a look here, let's see if I did one other trick. Eh, it's a little hard to tell. Sometimes I have to chop off the last beat, the last half of the last beat, and then put an echo in. Because if you are just listening, it goes, eh, boom, it sounds final, and then boom, the new thing comes in. That's a transition we're used to hearing. Um, and uh, the other thing I had to do is adjust the level of the music. So I'm going to just jump around, but it better be about the same volume on no matter where we are. Uh, we hear a lot of the volume, the dynamic range. If a symphony, you hear really quiet instruments and really loud sections. That's great for classical music. For our music, we need it to be about the same level of volume the whole way through while we're dancing. It can go down a little bit and up a little bit, but we're also maybe using our, our thumb wheel while it's happening. Um, I just wanted to see. So sometimes when I have two different pieces of music, I have to, I have to change make one louder or softer um, and it, what was it control uh, there, 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 there. so it's subjective I think Cotton Eye Joe is a little brighter than the other piece of music maybe I need to do something there but it's kind of about the same level I don't know any piece of software where I can I can select a region and say, how loud is this? That seems to be a subjective thing. I haven't seen something that can tell me that, because I'd like it just to be about the same level of loudness. Um, okay. Uh, I want to give one more example maybe of, uh, uh, let's see. Don't disturb the music. These are good. These are all good tunes. I like these. These are a little slower than what you dance modern western to, but... Um, yeah. Come on, Sound Studio, where are you? Thank you. 
Okay, so I don't remember this one. Wow. Anyone know this piece of music? Um, my generation. Who's the uh, Iglesias that we know? Julio Iglesias. Who's his son? Enrique. This is Enrique Iglesias, and this is popular with, like, my daughter's generation. This is Don't Turn Out the Light. Now, I can dance to this. I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to call patter over because there's a lot of words, right? And we don't, right? But if I'm contra dancing and we know the pattern, just moving along and jiving to this music is pretty good. Let's see if I can find a transition here. Um, oops, wrong one. Come on, Clark. Here we go. to this stuff and it really jazzes up the dancers mostly we do it to live music just like you would at real contra dances but when i want to do something with alternative music the people who are experienced contra dancers love dancing to this stuff so that's why we edit them it takes us about um four three to four hours to edit any given piece of music um you have to find the beats per, you have to fi- find the three pieces of music find the beats per minute of each one figure out the beats per minute you're going to dance at in this case 114 to 116 when you transition from one to the next, you better go up by one beat per minute or it feels like you're dancing to molasses. If you dance from 116 or 128 and change down to 126, even one or two beats per minute, suddenly you're like, oh, I hit this slow down. So it's good if you go up a beat per minute every time you change tunes, and then you're safe. If you kept it the same, that would work, but going up works. And um, we we add the, the beginning to it, this one, says 8p meaning eight potatoes um it's probably just a piece i cut out of the music and then it starts and then you have to put an ending on and like uh tim said a simple fade ending is pretty good sometimes the music comes with an ending and then you're set to go this has 15 copies which dances for about eight and a half minutes um I thought of one other thing to show you. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, if I sort this by name, and that's all the music, and that's too bad. Um, sometimes we put calling on this. Uh, here's one with calling. Uh, let me drag it over here and drag it into here. Um, so we just sit in a chair and call, and I run the mic in through a sound system and into the, the sound card, and uh, we play into headphones and record. And just like in the movies where you see that guy come out and go whack with a clapper, well, that clapper is to synchronize the video, the visual, with the audio, the sound of that thing clapping. And we have a tone which we play into the microphone, and then we go back and start doing it. And I line that tone up 
with what I hear with where the tone is in the music so I can get the voice aligned with this, the song. And uh, I do a little bit of editing, and we volume adjust it. And here you can see the calls. There's a call, there's a call, there's a call. And if I zoom out so you see, I'm going to make this bigger just so you get it better on the screen. Um, you can see occasional calls. Usually on these dances, you prompt, you prompt, you fade out so you're only saying something, and then kind of you fade out completely. So if we do fit in window, you can see by about here the dancer should have the dance. There's no more calling. And uh, this is what we'll be doing for the Zesty Contra stuff. Circle. Balance now. You circle to the left. I'll go again. And I'm going to zoom in just so you see it while the on the waveforms. Circle. Balance now. You circle to the left. You balance now. Face your neighbor. Five changes. Go. That would be a square through. Partner Gypsy with your partner balance and swing. And this piece of music is by a group called Kodo, which is a type of... Ja it's a, you know Kodo, right? It's a group in Japan that does... Uh, I don't know how to say the word. Taiko? Taiko drumming? Taiko. Taiko? No? Taiko drumming, right. And um, it's pretty powerful to dance to. When you have all these big drums and little drums going, it's just percussion. Um, so that's an example of what the final product is. Um, and then we can put that on and dance to it without having to have a caller call. And we have the caller can dance. That would be Lisa Greenleaf, who's a, a good contra dance caller in, in New England area. Clark, do you can record that to a separate track? I was hoping to see a separate track, and I didn't find it. We now have learned to record it two ways. If my voice music mix is not correct, once it's been mixed together, I'm screwed. There's no way I can fix it. So what we do now, and in small halls it's been okay, but we went to a bigger venue, and it, it wasn't. we couldn't crank up the voice like we needed to. So what I do now is I use the left channel for the voice and the right channel for the music. I get it approximately balanced and we save that out as a two-track file. And so it comes out of the CD player or the, the iPod in stereo. It goes into the sound system, and there's an option on some sound systems to mix the two channels and then send it out both the left and right speaker mixed. So we're doing the mixing in real time, and we have a separate volume control for the voice. And that's worked very well for us. So typically we save every file as a, as a two-track file and as a, and as a mi pre-mixed one like what you see. Okay, so you could use similar techniques if you wanted to, say, do your own harmony um, music. If you were doing score dance music and a singing call, you could put a voiceover on your your file, your digital file, in the computer using a microphone and singing into it and use similar techniques to get a harmony track. Correct. That, that? Um, I'm pretty much done. I'm happy. We have like five, four or five minutes, and then we're going to go into this uh, laptop lane thing where I'm happy to talk about any of the music editing stuff. Um, I also have choreography software, as will other people, or the how do you just play music at a dance or how do you do any of the stuff. So if there's any more music editing stuff, well, I've got it here where it's of interest to the room and we have it on the screen. If not, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, thank oh, you all for... Rich oh. Reel. <laughs> hey, it's Rich Reel from the area. Quick show of hands, how many people here do not currently call with a laptop but are thinking about it? Show of hands. One, two, three. Three, four, three. I think you would have four. gotten a bigger answer in the previous session. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to, I think um, Vic is supposed to be here too. Maybe we can keep this table up and oh. we can have separate tables around. But Unless we want to turn this stuff off.